I'm author and critic David Agronoff. I'm a horror and science fiction author, critic, and researcher. In this podcast, I wanted to provide in-depth interviews and panel discussions with everyone from New York Times bestselling authors to researchers, musicians, and anyone I find interesting. Welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Hello and welcome to Postcards from a Dying World, episode 104, I believe. It's either going to be 103 or 104, but we're getting up there, which is really cool. Um, My guest today is local for me and here in San Diego and a guy that I used to see all the time at book events uh, when I didn't live in OB and find it very hard to get out to book events lately. Um. But anyways, Jim Ruland is a San Diego writer and is the guy whose work I've really enjoyed and followed for many years. And he is the author of a book called Corporate Rock Sucks, the story of SST Records. And um, I'm really excited to talk to Jim about this book, but he has a long career of writing uh, not only like music biographies, which is what you've been doing a lot of lately, but you've got a novel coming out right soon, sir. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, really happy to be here and chatting with you. I don't think that I've been in a room with you since before the pandemic. I know it's been a bit. It's been a bit. Um, I'm going to we're probably moving back to that part of town. So you'll probably be seeing me more again. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the things about living in OB is it makes me feel really isolated, like I'm living in a different town, um, which there's nice things about that. But also it's weird. I just haven't been to book events, but Let's tell people about your career and where you got started in writing and got into, uh, you know, for, well, first of all, where did you grow up, Jim? Because I think you're from California, right? Or did you nope, start somewhere no, else? Actually, uh, I uh, come from a Navy family. So I was born in New York and moved all around the East Coast. I spent a lot of time in Virginia. I went to uh, high school in Northern Virginia. And, um, you know, my punk rock rebellion you know, took a uh, a different shape than other people and that I was like, well, I'm not going to be like you, dad. So instead of becoming an officer of the Navy, I'm going to enlist. Um, and that was my dumbass uh, punk rock rebellion move, which was very <laughs> sighted and not very well thought out. But uh, that's how I got out to California. I, uh, I got stationed in San Diego. And, um, and even though I keep trying to leave, uh, it keeps pulling me back. So uh, which came first, an interest in, in literature or music and punk rock? Um, books, books first. I was always a, a pretty big reader, but I was one of those kids who was, you know, I read all the time, but I was terrible at school. I mean, I was good when I was very young and really didn't have to do any work and just kind of fake it. But once things got challenging, I just couldn't bring myself to do the work. And uh, I would much rather, you know, you know, read, you know, read all the Michael Moorcock novels or plan a Dungeons and Dragons campaign or you right. know, do a deep dive in my comic book collection. I, I was that kind of a reader. So, Yeah, we I think we, we have kind of a similar path because a lot of these things are sounding familiar. Um, I uh, for me, it was interesting because I was always a big reader, but I was also dyslexic and had lots of learning disabilities. I had lots of struggles. So, you know even and even today i was working on i'm i'm publishing the i was asked to write an article for uh a, an english journal a journal in england and having to recalibrate my brain to english grammar is yeah. like really yeah. messing with me by the way um <laughs> <laughs> but uh so you're i can trace back to the first punk rock song that i heard for me it was nazi punks fuck off by the dead kennedys and it was like a lightning bolt straight to my brain of like, wow, this is really cool. Did you have a similar experience with punk rock? Do you remember where it started or? Um, I, I think it's a little hazy, but, um, you know, I I remember um, I had a paper route in uh, Northern Virginia. I delivered a Washington Post and I had one of those knockoff uh, um, Sony Walkmans that would just chew through batteries. 
And so I would make tapes off of um, off of a record player that my brother and I shared. He, you know, it was in his room, but we shared. And I think the, like the first record that really reached out and got me was the Ramones' second album, uh, "Leave Home," mm -hmm. and that was like, okay, I, I need a tape of this to take with me when I'm when I'm doing my paper route. Uh, it just kind of sped time up and everything went faster. And uh, and from there I had like, you know, I was, you know, made kind of slow discoveries and other things, you know, some dead ends and some other things that I still love today. Right. Now I'm asking all these questions about punk rock because we're going to be talking a lot about, yeah, yeah. about these, these books, but um, along the way, uh, long before you got into writing about punk rock, you had success uh, in other forms of writing. Now, where did you get serious about writing? I, I, I think I remember know where this came from, but I think your journey is really interesting and it would be good for my listeners to hear. Well, um, you know, it has a, a number of different fronts. As you know, I, I love books. I love literature. I love, you know, edgy literature and genre literature. You know, I've gone through different phases where I felt like I needed to read every hard-boiled crime novel there ever was, just like when I was a kid and seeking out, you know, all the different series that were lighting up my imagination, whether it was sci-fi, fantasy, horror, or whatever it was. But um, it really, um, you know, I the, I was in the Navy for for a couple of years, and so that kind of it was derailed my education in a sense, but increased my punk rock education. So while other people were like starting to get serious about their careers, whether it be writing or whatever it is, you know, I was, you know, out in the fleet being a knucklehead, but meeting all these interesting people who are turning me on to, you know, metal and punk and, you know, oi and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, and I was just, I, I loved it all. And that's when I started to really understand that like, you know, extreme music and edgy music and stuff that's on the margins, it really kind of emerges from a scene. You know, it comes from a particular place. It's not like, um, you know, it's not just mass produced. It has nothing to do with the radio. It's it's more organic. And that really made sense to me. And so, I mean, it, that led to me when I started to write, um, writing for zines. And I was a, I wrote for Flipside doing like cd reviews in uh, the mid 90s and that led to me doing interviews that's at that point i was living in la every band came through there and it was pretty easy to to you know interview whoever i wanted and so where if, even though the scene wasn't quite as organic because la being what it is i learned you know like oh like i really like the beach punk coming out of this area this part of northern orange county or i like I like the Hollywood street punk here. And I, I like, and I started to understand, you know, that, oh, this pocket of Orange County was really important in uh, in the early eighties. And like, oh, wow, all this stuff coming out of the Valley at this particular time was just as important. So I started to learn the history of LA punk and was really enthralled by uh, the different scenes. Right. And the way we first met was you were doing these uh, reading series. I know both in L.A. and in San Diego called The Vermin on the Mount. And, you know, I just walked in because I, I don't remember which was the first one I came to, but it was one where there was an author reading who I really wanted to see. And then I kind of became a regular going to them for a little bit and uh, was able to read it one once. Um, yep. And uh, Vermin on the Mount is like I think takes the punk rock ethic of building the scene and brings it to literature. So can you tell the folks a little bit about, you know, that series and where it came from? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, we were doing, um, so after Flipside folded around the end of the century, which sounds weird to say that, but um, um, one of the editors there, Todd, who was also um, a buddy of mine from grad school, he, started up razor cake two guys from, from two friends of mine from grad school sean carswell and todd taylor started up razor cake in highland park california and um you know well, northeast la and so i just started doing what i was doing for flip side there but i was also um 
you know, I felt like I wasn't a very good writer. I felt like my commitment wasn't as as strong as it could be. You know, my I would send out stories. I would do different pitches, and I would have little success success here and there. But um, but I think I liked the the hanging out and the partying and the punk rock stuff a little bit too much. Um, so right, it, it, it took a while for things to develop. But when we were doing Razor Cake, um. You know, I would help. I would be. I would do events with Todd or Sean or other people, and then at one point, um, I remember this very clearly. Uh, um, Todd was friends with Joe Mino from Chicago, and he was like, "Hey, can you help set up a reading for Joe?" And I was like, "Well, why don't we do it instead of like having it being Joe and like the usual, you know, three or four people that you know we do readings with, and so that the ten same ten or twenty people that show up." why don't I invite like a really diverse range of people, people who would not be in the same room together and just see what happens. And so I pitched that idea to a guy in uh, Chinatown and uh, at, at the mountain bar and he loved it. And um, he like, like you said about like there being the, he liked the punk rock ethos of it, of like it being very different and organic and anything goes. And um and Chinatown also plays a very important part in uh, L.A. punk rock history. And so he was aware of all that. And he really liked the idea of continuing at that with a reading series. One and of my so, favorite horror movies was filmed in Chinatown as well. Uh, what, what's Dark, the, Prince of Darkness. Oh, right on. Right on. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted the interview. You were talking about Chinatown and the importance towards uh, Vermin on the Mountain punk rock. Yeah, so um, without really uh, meaning to, we kind of created our own little literary scene. And only thing that it did different is that I noticed that if you were a poet, there are plenty of places to read your work. But if you were a fiction writer, not as many options. And if you were like a journalist, and in my view, journalists sometimes have the best stories to share, like the story around the story. Um, oh, absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. So I started asking, you know, all kinds of other, you know, a poet, a, writer, a fiction writer, a journalist, you know, somebody, some punk rocker with something to say, you know, it was, it wasn't really a formula, but it was just wanted to have like a, a mix of people. I didn't want, you know, five poets or six people, you know, debut novelists or, you know, nothing like that. Well, and it was cool because for a while you were doing them in both LA and San Diego, and 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 so it create it created a really like cool scene, and and um I discovered lots of authors who um like I'd never heard of before, but were ones that like uh an example I'd give is Jimmy Jazz, somebody yeah. who yeah Jimmy is a person who uh I discovered through Vermin on the Mount and whose uh, work I, I I super enjoy, and I would. I, <laughs> Without Vermin on the Mountain, I wouldn't have, right? San so. Diego legend. Absolutely. Jimmy Jazz. Yeah. I mean, he, really, he was doing uh, Vermin on the Mountain type stuff like 20 years before that. Right. And his, his book on uh, being a substitute teacher is just uh, super fantastic. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to that one in particular that I really, really liked um so so you did vermin on for a couple of years um you got published i believe you got published with fiction first right for full-length book or can you tell folks about the, um your early publishing yeah sure well i mean i mean it was really just the one book i was mostly writing zines and then razor cake had a publishing arm called gorski press and uh, the publisher, Sean, knew that I had been writing a bunch of stories and published some of them, not and some not. And uh, so we did a short story collection together, and uh, that was called Big Lonesome. And it came out in 2005. And and in a way, it was great. You know, I loved doing it, but it was also, you know, it was a basement press. It was very small. It was meaningful to me and, uh, you know, the people who read it. But um then I started doing that thing in my head where it's like, it's been two years since I wrote a book. I got to write another one. It's been three years. It's been five years, you know, all that kind of weird thing that you do. And um, that's, that's right. ridiculous and not very healthy. And, um, 
and I, and I feel like even though uh, I'm kind of like taking over taking over the uh, the interview in a sense that things really didn't change or happen for me until I got sober in 2009. And when that happened, it kind of uh, woke me up to my priorities. And, um, you know, after that is when I started having the um, just the energy and the uh, and the ambition to um, pursue lar larger projects and see them through to the end. Well, yeah, and and um, it's it's great to look. I'm straight edge, so I'm biased, you know. Yeah. And, but I don't know any other way because I've been straight edge since I was 15 years old, right? Um, but it seems to me like for you that was an important part of like you know knuckling down and getting into like the career. And now you have really establish yourself as a biographer of musicians and like the transition to go from that i you know i'm sure somebody recognized your work doing all the work with the zines with razor cake and flip side and all that and said you're the guy to do this and specifically the relationship from flip side to where you're going to get with sst records i mean that's a pretty clear path right but yeah someone had to see that did you see that did you start that path or did you have somebody come to you and say i need somebody to write this book with keith morris for example like how did how did how did that punk rock historian thing happen <laughs> right yeah well i mean i i think like um you know the the difference between the work i did in flip side and the work i did for razor cake is that i think like the work I did in Flipside, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do this and, and maybe it'll lead somewhere, which is really not a good reason to do anything, whether it's a, a podcast or starting a magazine or any kind of literary project. Um, I mean, you, you should do it because you want to do it and you feel called to it. And um, and as much as I enjoyed um, like interviewing bands and hanging out with bands and partying with bands like it was some it would take me like i would be late with the interview and it would take me forever to transcribe and i would lose things I, I was just not a very good or reliable um writer in any sense and then when my friends started a razor cake you know they made this commitment and i could see like okay these are my friends it's their magazine they're doing a significant finance investment of time and money like i can't i can't be the fuck up on the masthead anymore and so I, I took it more seriously, but I started doing it for myself and stopped thinking that it was ever going to lead anywhere and started do, pursuing things that I really wanted to do. And so ironically, some of the writing I did was like less punk, if that makes sense. It was just stuff that I really wanted to care about and I wanted to investigate. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question about Keith Morris, it was it was my agent who came to me and he was... Uh, um you know close he had worked with a guy who was a publisher named uh who's an editor at um the capo named ben schaefer and they were talking one day and saying like you know who needs a book is keith morris it's a shame i mean it's a crime that there isn't a book um that keith morris doesn't have a book telling his story i mean he's a legendary finger figure in southern california punk rock you can't tell the story of southern california punk rock without keith morris so um my agent was like i got just the guy he's like well what do you think about it and um you know i had a meeting with keith and i had i had met with keith before i'd interviewed him for like one of the zines i was writing for like a profile zine when he was doing some djing i had i hosted an event before vermin on the mouth that he would that i invited him to so we kind of knew each other but not you know we weren't friends or anything like that um right. So I, th but I think it was the fact that I had written for Flipside and was writing for Razor Cake that made Keith say, "Yeah, well, I'll I'll write with I'll go with this guy as opposed to someone who was you know writing for Spin or Rolling Stone." You know, right? And it's it's interesting because I was just um, a really good companion book to your book. One that I just read is uh, is um, Sellout by D Dan Ozzy, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but. I was writing my review of it this morning and it was really interesting because I just had that thought like 
well we're to the point where like punk rock is getting these like big hardcover history books and if you had asked me as a fan of the circle jerks in the late 80s as a teenager like oh one day you're going to be reading keith morris's history in a hardcover nationally released book i would have found that you know weird to believe but at the same time i know what a legend he is in our community so at the same time it also makes perfect sense right yeah well i mean it also like you think about the people who are your age my age people who are a little bit older you know these some of these people are now gatekeepers right you know they they work at publishing houses they work at film studios they 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 are in control of advertising money for um, different products and like they have their own time you know rolling or being the misfit of their town skateboarding around listening to circle jerks on the headphones and everybody thinking they were a weirdo and then realizing you know like no i, I mean there's a lot of other people out there who listen to this music too it's just they, they all lived in different places well totally and and um i think that's funny because I know I've had meetings before with people who like you, you think they're like you said, they're gatekeepers and you think they don't understand anything. Like, you know, there was a filmmaker who I met with about the rights to one of my books. And then we got into a weird side conversation where he was like, man, I'd love to make a biopic about the misfits. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't even, think there was a possibility this guy even knew who the misfits were right? right and then he had a pretty good pitch for it actually when he got down to it and i hope one day he gets to make it but you know it's it's bizarre to think about like you know like you said that that some of these people are gatekeepers so it was a publisher that said like keith morris deserves and needs a book and they were right because it's a great book and the stories are fantastic so yeah, I mean tell me Tell me about the process on working on that book. Now, I've grilled you personally about this before. <laughs> so sure. I, I know some of this, but I think in listeners, it would be really cool for them to hear like your experience. Well, you know, Keith is a national treasure and he has an extremely distinctive voice in the sense that, uh, you know, he was... You know, he was born in California, born in Los Angeles, bopped around a little bit, but for the most part was raised in Hermosa Beach, California. And half of his family um, uh, are, are Jewish and the other half are originally from, I think, uh, Oklahoma or Arkansas or something. And and so, um, you know, he has a very distinct American background and, and his, you know, growing up, you know, in... The, you know the 70s the 60s and 70s in Hermosa Beach California which be, eventually become the birthplace of hardcore thanks to him and Greg Ginn and Black Flag and the church and SST um you just a, a very interesting background I mean when you think about it like in 1977 what was considered extreme music you know I mean for some people it was it was Ted Nugent. For some people, it was prog rock. You know, it just really depended on, you know, what your version of, version of it was. For some, it was like Kiss, but other people who were like really extreme music were just totally dismissive of that as just theatrical. So, um, just well, really and fast. one thing, one thing that your book uh, that we're going to get to, Corporate Rock Sucks, and I think dan ozzy's sellout book do a really good job of is painting the idea and you mentioned scenes earlier but one thing that's so important about punk rock that people who weren't involved in it might not understand is how important the scene is that these bands came out of because yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons why the first question when somebody's like oh there's this hardcore band you should hear the first question i ask is where are they from that's I, it's not like, who do they sound like? It's where are they from? Because I'm more interested in the scene that they came out of. And I think what you're saying about Hermosa Beach is really important because I don't think people understand, like, what a unique alchemy <laughs> the, the, the SST and Heath Morris and 
the descendants and all that stuff like that came out of Hermosa Beach. Like what an important thing it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was like if you did a list of all the people who um, attended Miracosta High School in Manhattan Beach, which is like the corner that is like really close to Redondo Beach and, and uh, Hermosa Beach. Um, even though I lived in Manhattan Beach for almost 10 years, that whole geography gets really confusing to me because you can be in parts of it where, um, you know, I thought the beaches were just, you know, all stacked on top of each other, but you can be in Manhattan and have parts of Redondo to the north of you. And it's just very confusing. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you have like, you know, Black Flag, the Descendants, uh, um, Red Cross, uh, all these different bands, you know, members of bands, um, um, you know, who went to, uh, you know, Miracosta High School and would would play a part of these different stories. But working even, with you, even strangely enough, Dag Nasty, a band that started in D.C., but you got Doug Carrion, who ended up, you know, when when Brian Baker was kind of sort of living in Manhattan Beach and became a part of that. Then one of the guys from the Descendants becomes an important member of Dag Nasty, which is an interesting thing too. Yep. Uh, and another person who has an interesting connection to Manhattan Beach is Jay Bentley of Bad Religion. His his father, when his parents divorced, moved down there. So um, it, it's kind of a kind of a, an unusual, interesting little mecca of um, uh, of uh, punk and hardcore. But like, still so fast forward. I'm working with Keith. You know what? Are you know Keith has such a distinctive voice, and as much as I enjoyed listening to his stories, the most important thing for me was making sure the voice was right. So right. it involved lots and lots of of taped interviews that that I would transcribe, um, just hours and hours and hours of interviews. And and Keith is a great storyteller. Um, if you've ever seen him, not so much lately, but, you know, he was very outspoken on stage and would not think twice about, you know, ripping off three songs that are, you know, one and a half, two minutes each. And then uh, and then talking to the crowd for just as long and then ripping off some more songs. Um, he's he, no one sounds like Keith. No one tells stories like Keith. So it was really important that the books sound like Keith. So. I would ask him stories over and over again. And sometimes he would repeat himself. And then sometimes like new details would pry loose. And in those tellings and retellings, I got to understand like what Keith's, you know, go to, you know, cues were, you know, like how he, you know, how he reflected on things, how he thought about things and how he, uh, you know, when he got gets riled up about things, which is, which is awful. <clears throat> often and awesome because you know Keith is a very passionate guy and um well and uh, tell me about the retelling because I've been trying there there's a an author who one day I hope to write a biography about and I've done a few interviews just because I don't want to miss the chance to get those interviews even though I don't plan to write the book for a long time and I'm I, the subject of this book I've been trying to convince him that there is valor <laughs> or merit in telling the story multiple times because you might remember things that you didn't get the first time. And, you know, I get a lot of pushback on like, well, we've already talked about this. Yes, I know, but let's talk about it again and let's see if we get something. Like what's a, a thing that you got from Keith from hearing a story multiple times? Do you have an example? Yeah. Well, I know it was a couple of years ago, so. No, no, I, it's very clear in my mind actually, because, um, um, with Keith, it was a different challenge because he would repeat himself. And people who are in the public eye will often tell a story. And the story is just that. It's a story that they tell to reporters, to media figures, to interviewers, to people outside the show. It's, it becomes a thing unto itself. It stops becoming a memory or a, a recollection or, or even a reflection that you think about critically about something that happened, but it just becomes a story that you tell. Right. And, um, and, and it's like, you want people to like the first times I met up with Keith, I was just soaking everything up. I'd be like, I can't believe I'm sitting in Keith Morris's apartment. And he's telling me stories about um, the church and Hermosa beach and all that kind of stuff, you know, like the writing of wasted and things like that. But there was a, 
he I was very interested in his departure from Black Flag, and it's not something that he often talks about. And mainly because the formation of the Circle Jerks happened so quickly afterwards, like almost too quickly. So in a sense that there was not this mourning period, there wasn't like he had a solo project or he was doing something else. He would like literally went from one to another. Um, and he told me two different times where he saw Black Flag after he had left the band. Once he thought they were terrible and once he thought they were amazing. And I think he said, it, it's in the book, but I think he said it was at... Um, Cafe de Grande, and it was a small show, and it was Henry Rollins performing, and it was like a bomb went off, and and then I kept wanting to know like how he felt after he saw them, and they were amazing, um, because it was like very much a story of him, um, you know, hyping up his friends, hyping up his former band, you know, like you know, just it just was a story, and I asked it, and I asked, and I asked, and finally. I got him to admit that that he felt jealous that he was like I, that this is the band I always knew it could be and Henry got them there and I didn't and I felt jealous even though he was had, enjoying you know a, a great deal of success with uh circle jerks at the time it's just a very human raw feeling right it's like wow right. like they did it and maybe me leaving was the thing that needed to happen for it to for them to get there which is uh you know which was a big moment you know in the book and for him right and then so um and i remember around the time that the book came out you you did a really cool book event here and so you guys had a lot of, you got a chance to kind of you had the experience of actually being the one that helped foster getting Keith Morris's story out to the world. What was that experience like when the book came out and you had, you know, and it was out floating in the world that had to be a cool feeling. I mean, it really was. Um, it was, a, you know, because I think I've alluded to the fact that, um, you know, that, I, you know, I've been a, not always the most reliable writer for different zines and, so I think there are only like maybe a handful of times where a band I interviewed or something I wrote ended up being like a cover of a zine, you know, a flip side or razor cake. There's a couple, but um, it wasn't necessarily something that I sought, but like I always thought it would be very cool if it happened, if it went, if and when it happened. And, um, and uh, I can't tell you the last time it was, but it was, it's just like one of those things. It's like, wow, that's me on a cover it didn't happen very often so right. i was kind of you know but at the same time i was seeing my work published every other month for years and years and years and years and years so um when i saw the book it was really kind of a, a shock by how i felt about it because one it's got this illustration of keith by raymond pettibone and yeah i just couldn't believe that here's this book you know, with Keith's name on it and with the illustration by Raymond Pettibone and there's my name down there too. And I'm like, holy shit, like, how did this happen? I mean, I, even though I lived through this, I didn't really understand how it happened. Right. I said I had the experience of seeing it on the new release shelf at the library in my hometown mm. when I was back home in Indiana and being like, ah, oh, that's really cool that like this library is got the keith morris and jim's book right so um yeah i mean it's it's keith's book you know i mean that that's also the thing is that um and it's very easy to be um to not have an ego about it because you know uh keith is such an incredible person um he's he's a cult figure he's a living legend but like the guy does not have like well, I mean, maybe people in his bands would differ, but like, he's just very, <laughs> very approachable, you know, not a big look at me kind of person. Uh, yeah. And still, I, and still grinding. I mean, taking yeah. seven seconds, a negative approach out on the road just last year, you know? Yeah. Um, and I did an event with Keith. I set it up like it was Keith doing an event uh, with Alice Bag 
and um, a couple other writers. And Keith got there early and um, he starts setting up chairs. And it was like a, it was a DIY space and it was really just a microphone and some chairs. So he was like, oh, where's the water? We need some water. And he disappeared and he went next door and bought a bunch of water for everybody. And uh, that's just, just kind of how he is, you know? Right. Uh, and so it's, I I'm just really happy for everything good that happens to Keith. Yeah. yeah and he kind of, he kept it real. Like, you know, he's, he wasn't like on any major labels or, you know, like, you know, he, he, not that I'm not, anti that and we'll we'll talk about that more when we get to corporate rock sucks but um i guess an interesting contrast to that is your experience in writing for you know bad religion who was a band who did get scooped up by a major and you know was a part of that wave and started off in the same scene but got to uh much um greater commercial success and so how did the Bad Religion book happen? Now, again, these are things I know a little bit about because I was super stoked for you when you got this gig as being a Bad Religion fan myself. So uh, uh, that was is just right place, right time in the sense that, um, you know, when Bad Religion was looking for a writer, uh, the Keith Morris paperback had just come out. So it was kind of like had reappeared and, you know, was front and center and, the punk communities, you know, um, you know, right in their path of vision, right? And and you know, Circle Jerks and Bad Religion were very close, uh, closely tied together at the very beginning of the career. And those bands, they've been crossing paths, you know, for for decades. Um and then uh the the band's manager, um, I don't know if I should tell the story, but I'm going to anyway. Um, and he was the one who was tasked with finding a writer. Um, he's from, well, I won't say where he's from, but where he is, where he was living. Um, it just so happened that I have a bunch of writer friends. So he'd go out and he'd see a writer and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm looking for a writer. And he'd be like, who should we do? He's like Jim rule. He just wrote Keith Morris book. He's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And then th that kept happening. So, um, I got very lucky in, in that sense. And, uh, and in, in that my my agents in the field were able to do some good work for me but um but you know keith's book was very well received and you know and so i think that was also part of it too and that people liked it and that it was um that it sounded like keith that it was not like some you know fanboy kind of thing right uh, so i i think that's you know i did not lobby for that um i didn't say hey you guys should write a book and i should write i mean nothing like that yeah, yeah they came to you okay well and so the thing with writing the bad religion book is that did you approach it from did you did you say like okay i got this process from keith but now i got five people i gotta write about six really because like brian baker gets involved and you know, various members come in and out, like, um, you know, did you outline at the beginning, like, here's what I need to do, here's what I need to learn, what was the process on the Bad Religion book? Um, well, I was very excited, um, but also scared shitless, um, and the reason for that was, I knew that, um, you know, like, there's, you know, with a lot of band books, or a lot of rock books, right, there's this long period of struggle right or the period of struggle is overemphasized and then like the really productive years or like the iconic albums and then there's uh usually like some drug or alcohol issue maybe some divorce um and then you know fall from grace and then uh personal redemption and then a return to form kind of thing right i mean this is this is not the punk rock story it's kind of the rock and roll story right you know where right um it's in it's in unless you are uh a straight edger like yourself uh <laughs> then it's it's really hard if you get if you're in that lifestyle you either you make a decision not to use drugs or alcohol or to stop using drugs or alcohol or you die i mean there's just there's those are really the three three outcomes especially in punk rock well and i had a, i had a friend i'm not going to say which band but he he had idolized this band 
growing up and uh, they were just starting and but they were his favorite band and then he became the guitar player for that band and then they signed to a major label and he immediately quit and one of the things that when i asked this buddy of mine like man it seems like you got your dream you got and he was like you and he told me he's like one year touring taught him that there it was very hard to be a human being and be on the road as a touring musician like all the time and he didn't want to be on that cycle he just knew it right away like i've heard that i've heard that so many times from so many different musicians that it's uh and, and i think if you're a creative person uh it's even harder now if you're like a if you're like a guy who doesn't like write music but you can shred like hell on the on a guitar or beat the hell out of the drums and you're a touring musician that's fine like that's what you do but yeah. um if you're a creative person um like touring is like one of the least creative things that you can do it's just being bossed around being told where you need to be and when you have to be there and you know hurry up while you're at it and you know it's not that much fun um so right well and um you have uh with bad religion you have very specifically you have brett guritz who like just basically was like i need somebody to do that part for me yeah well like, like that was it like to answer your question about why i was like you know terrified is because well sorry why i was stoked is because there's conflict all over the bad religion story i mean yeah. the the band's second album you know broke up the band and you know they had this like long fallow period afterwards and um which is really fascinating and then and then you have like that incredible run of uh, of suffer and no control and against the grain which are just you know undeniably amazing, amazing records, runs, yeah, records yeah. that really galvanized you know the punk community in an exciting new way um and then you had like the major label and the band splitting up and brett leaving the band and um you know brian baker you know you know coming in and uh you know, me growing up in Northern Virginia and, you know, Minor Threat being one of my, you know, one of those early punk favorites. Um, well, Dag was, Nasty is one of my all-time favorite bands ever, ever, of anything ever. <laughs> so I had so, a ton of respect for Brian Baker. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, in spite of everything he's done, still a, um, I think, a uh, underappreciated guitar player. Absolutely. So, so that was exciting, but the terrifying thing was is that Bad Religion put out a bunch of albums, and I didn't know all of them. I don't think I knew half of them. So I was not like a Bad Religion expert. I was good at interviewing people and, and pulling a story together out of these disparate events and making a, a readable narrative, but I wasn't like Mr. Bad Religion. I wasn't like, oh yeah, in 1985, you know, like I became that person, <laughs> now, and now i'm forgetting it all but you know like i that wasn't me so but I'm... i did so many songs i didn't know so um and in fact the first time i went to see bad religion i think it was even before I, sorry first time i went to see bad religion while i was working for bad religion we were still working on the proposal so we had not gotten a book deal yet and it was at the house of blues and Nubia and i my wife we were watching the band and she knew more songs than I did. And I'm like, how the hell do you know all these songs? You know, it's like, <laughs> what can I well, say? Well, it's, it's funny too, because I'm, I'm sure it, it and you, you mentioned uh, when we were talking about sometimes before we were recording, like sometimes if you've got a nonfiction book, like you got to go when you're like in that zone and you've got that thing. So like perhaps, you know, with like bad religion, it might be a thing of like during that era of writing that book, you knew a lot more than probably even like today. Like a lot of it's going to leak out of your head. But during that time when you're in that zone with that band, it had to be a really cool experience to kind of mind meld with that um, entity that is bad religion, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I started with a set list. To find out like okay like what you know i took the set list from that show and i was like okay where do these records come from what are the eras who wrote these songs you know who were who was in the band who was out and then 
and then I went organically from there. You know, I I, I got a, I started reading more set lists, and you know, getting into deeper cuts. And by then, I was ready to go through the albums, you know, one by one, and be like, um, you know, develop my own personal favorite songs, and uh, uh, and go from there. Well, it's funny because that trilogy of amazing records, the Suffer, No Control, Against the Grain. Um, I have a friend that is a, a metal journalist, uh, Ryan J. Downey. And Ryan and I talk about, we, you know, I've been trying to get him to refer to the, the, the second through fifth or the, the second through whatever, the Metallica records that came, Ride the Lightning, Puppets, and Injustice for All as the trilogy, right? It's like a trilogy. And I think a lot of these bands that have these long catalogs, a lot of times you have this era where they're in the zone, where they're just like writing songs like like A Bad Out of Hell. And for me, that, that three record stint for Bad Religion is there's at least... 25 to 30 songs from those three records where i'm like that is an amazing punk rock song that will just not knock your socks off mm. personally my absolute favorite bad religion song is henchmen and what oh. um which is yeah. funny because i i one of the reasons why i bring it up is because i think a lot of times with these bands there's these random songs that like maybe they're not the big hit right it's not uh, against the grain or you are the government or whatever but they they have these like random songs that just show their ability as punk rock musicians to just write an amazing song and for me that's henchman i just think henchman is one of the best punk rock songs that they ever wrote yeah that's my opinion but yeah, they're um yeah the, the the rain bad religions it's interesting because bad religion um you know they have a uh there's a template right you can you hear a bad religion song you write it when the first 15 seconds you know this is bad religion but within that template the range of styles and types of songs that they have in their catalog is incredible it's stuff that none of their contemporaries in you know the the skate punk era you know uh, could ever approach like no effects or pennywise they, they don't have that range and it's not a criticism against them it's just saying that there's there's just a lot of stuff to discover in the bad religion catalog and it, it's really rewarding so you've interviewed a lot of bands and been around a lot of bands but you got really close to this band so i'm wondering like what did you think was unique about the personalities in um in uh, bad religion and how did you try to translate that into telling their story well i i think um you know they're all the thing that stands out to me is that they're brilliant people they're really really smart and um you know the perseverance is the thing that kind of is the secret to bad religion's success because as a lot of bands will tell you it's like there comes a point where you just you don't like each other anymore you can't stand each other you know so perseverance is, is a big thing but the intelligence of the of the band band members you know i mean i think that everybody in punk rock knows about greg geffen's um geffen's bonafides as an academic and a scholar yeah um, and i think you know people maybe don't think about as much as you know uh you know brett garowitz entrepreneurial yeah you know success um but i find um like brian baker's intellect in terms of musical knowledge and being able to reproduce it on a guitar he um, is an incredible songwriter i i would love to pick his brain just on his writing process i think that I would mean, be he is, but yeah <laughs> he, is, he is an incredible musician and extremely smart and in some ways like like conversationally maybe like the quickest the fastest you know like really really sharp like like he's someone you kind of want to be on your toes around you know like you don't want to say something stupid around around brian and then um and then jay bentley is a uh, emotional intelligence you know and his you know way he's like is the glue of the band and you know can you know holds things together and picks on different roles and does different things that 
um, over the years that have really helped, you know, uh, helped bad religion, um, you know, stay together. Um, even though he was the first member of the band to quit. Well, not the first, but uh, after their first drummer, he was the first one to quit. Well, an, an interesting thing about Brian Baker, and I, I don't want to totally drill down totally on him, but he is the one that whose music I'm the most familiar with. And, and But one thing that I really respect about Brian Baker is like how still energized, like the doing Beach Rats and fake names and like, you know, but like doing a hardcore band like Beach Rats now, you know, that he's starting a new hardcore band, right? And yeah. I know it's just an Instagram post, but one thing that really impressed me with Brian Baker, because w growing up in the scene, like a lot of times, like the older people in the scene, you always like, oh, well, they, you saw a lot of bands mutate into post hardcore. And I know he had his junkyard phase and he did all that. But a couple of years ago, I, he did a post on Instagram where he had a stack of hardcore records from the nineties that he was like, unbroken snap case all this stuff and he was like i'm he's like i'm in a mood for 90s hardcore and it was so impressive to me because a lot of people from his generation like that's the young kids stuff right and they're not listening to the next generation and it was impressive to me he had a fucking undertow record which is like a rare like very little known seattle straight edge band and there was like i when i saw the undertow record in that stack i was like that dude's a real fucking hardcore guy. And I love that about Brian Baker. And I think it's reflected in the scope of his songwriting that he like doesn't turn away from, you know, that's why he can evolve, I guess, is one of the things I'm saying with him. But I was impressed by that. So yeah, well, I, I got to be, I had the uh, privilege of being in the studio for parts of the recording of the most recent record. And um my my memory is already starting to go about like there was there was one song um um anyway they had there was a song that had they had two versions of it a fast version and a slow version and they weren't, weren't sure which way they were going to go yet and there was one section that uh brett felt like could use a uh you know like you know, a bit of like a guitar solo but like in the background and so there wasn't like a look at me fret melting type of thing, but more like, you know, kind of like a almost mournful weeping guitar that's in the back that kind of sells the emotion of the song. I don't know if I'm making any sense on my guitar player, but uh, so like Brian was like, yeah, I can do that. And so Brett, um, he's like, yeah, give me this. Uh, like you'd play the track, give me this in this style. And Brett did it. He's like, okay, let's do it again, but let's make it more a little, uh, more surfy more cowboy surf like that, something like that that's not what he said but like the communication and the uh, between brett and brian was so good that he only that's needed awesome. to say a couple things and brian understood what brett wanted you didn't have to give a lot of direction about how to do it or what to do he's just like this is what i want and i'm looking for it can you do it this way he's like sure and and this is not happening like this is just actually just happening like in the control booth area. So I'm right, you know, Brett's on my right and Brian's on my left. And this is just happening. And I'm like right, right in the middle. I'm like afraid to make a sound, even though it didn't really matter because it's all, you know. But like when Brian was playing, was like at one point I was like, you know, like I wanted to like reach out and touch the guitar. It was just like the like some kind of sorcery that was coming out of that guitar. I'm like, this dude could fucking do anything. That's awesome. That is a really cool story to hear. So I'm glad we got there. <laughs> now you wrote the bad religion book. It comes out. It's, it's a big deal. Like, um, where do you go from there? You're going to do, you know, uh, and then we end up with corporate rock sucks. Now I, I, I know it was a, tough time to sell this book uh what's the story behind uh, the origins of this book yeah well i mean i uh it really is a continuation of uh the the story of um you know keith and hermosa beach right uh, i mean you're gonna be shocked so did you have this idea to do this book eventually from back then no 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 it was okay. actually it was actually another project that was suggested to me and i actually 
actually thought it was a very good idea because I'd sat with Keith for a long, long time and he had, had heard all the colorful words that you can imagine that he would say about Greg Ginn. So right. I knew his feelings about about Greg and I knew his feelings about how you know the people on the label had been treated. So uh, when I actually started thinking about it, the first person I talked to was Keith. I was like, well, what do you think? I mean, this, this is a bad idea, right? He's like, no, you should do it. Um, it's like brilliant musicians came out of that label and someone should tell the story. You should, yeah, you should definitely do it. And I was like, oh, wow. Well, like that wasn't really, I wasn't expecting that at all. You know, I was entertaining <laughs> it because, um, you know, I, I lived in Hermosa Beach for almost, sorry, Manhattan Beach for, whoops, I'm misspeaking again. I lived in Manhattan Beach for a couple of years and then Playa del Rey for a bunch of other years. So almost 10 years in LA South Bay. Uh, apologies to South Bay listeners who consider Playa del Rey the Mayberry of the South Bay. It is. It's not real South <laughs> Bay, I know, but I, I was down there. And um, and I was really fascinated with this story. And Keith and I actually went on a field trip there when we were working on his book. We went to Pollywog Park, <clears throat> which you probably know this story. And that's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me when black flag in the early days of black flag got a a gig playing at Pollywog park by uh, by telling the promoter they were a fleetwood mac cover band and which is you know black flag is many things but what they're, they're not most a fleetwood not, mac cover band <laughs> is not that yeah and uh it was an infamous show because people were throwing things at the band but it was all kind of in good humor i mean and in many ways keith was encouraging them to do that um because it was a bunch of people a bunch of punk rockers that came to see them play and also people who were just at the at the park just saying what the fuck is this and here's keith encouraging them to throw things at them and so they did and um it later got billed as a as a riot and the people that put on the show were really embarrassed because i think before them, the band that was supposed to play was like the the Air Force band or some shit like that. But um, it's one of those things where uh, it was July 22nd, 1979. You know, Black Flag is playing. The Tourists had opened up for them, which was uh, a number of the members of Red Cross. That's what Red Cross would become. And every punk rocker in the South Bay or anyone in, from half of South of Hollywood was there. So you had people that were going to be in circle jerks, people that would end up in bad religion. Like there were two members who would play in bad religion where, I mean, it was like, and nothing of this sort had ever happened in Southern outdoors in Southern California, you know, in that part of, you know, South Bay before. And it was spot who would go on to produce a bunch of bands for uh, SST was there and had taken a bunch of pictures and it was just like one of those landmark moments. And it happened in Manhattan Beach. And when I lived there, I was just kind of fascinated by this idea of hardcore history happening in this little beach town. And um, and also, it's a little embarrassing, but my birthday is July 22nd. So um, it was even more magical because it had happened on my birthday. You know, Granted, I was 11 at the time. I was not there, but... Uh, it's just something that I was always thought was interesting. I'd always wanted to write about. I, I still do. I still, I think it would make a great oral history of, of that day. Um, because well, so many and, and I got to say for me personally, and it was, it, your book was an interesting test case for me because um, I'm a old school punk rocker, but SST and black, I've never been a black flag fan. Mm -hmm. Never. And uh, for SST, the three bands, Bad Brains, obviously. Bad Brains, Husker Du, and The Descendants are really the only SST bands that really tickled my fancy at all. Yeah. And so it was interesting to me because when when um when I got your book, a part of my thinking was, well, I'm gonna see if this is as interesting to me because I wasn't really into it. And I had already had heard all the bad things about Craig, and, yeah. you know, and how tough he was to be in a band with. And so I kind of knew 
those things. But for me, the most interesting parts was the early history, like all the major label stuff. And when the record label was starting to collapse was not as interesting to me. And we already talked about how I like scenes. I yeah. loved all the stories of the formation of that scene. To me, that was the most powerful part of the book. Now, I, I was interested in all of it, was all interesting, and it, but it was a test case for me because I'm not a big SST fan, and I and but I did find the history of the label to be very fascinating in, in that regard. So, um, but the research for that kind of an event in those early days had to have been really uh, something interesting. So I'm very interested in how you researched these early days. It had to be oral history. You had to, there wasn't books about this, right? Like you had to do tons of interviews, I'd imagine, right? I, I did. I did a, a lot of uh, interviews and like, I know you're writing a book about uh, Philip K. Dick. And I think we had some of the same problems because obviously the first person I reached out to um when I started this project was Greg Ginn. I also was 99.9% .9 sure that I was never going to hear back from him. I was wrong. He did reply and he said that he was not interested in participating. And, and I, in a way I was relieved because if he had said, yeah, let's, let's do this. Um, I, it would, it would have changed a lot of things about the book, I think, but it also would have uh, taken a lot longer and I would have had to sift through a lot of like he said, she said kind of stuff, like a lot of and also some revisionist history, I suspect. I don't know. So so you're making the comparisons because my guy's dead and your guy didn't want to talk to you at all. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also, here's the other thing about Phil. Phil told every story Phil ever told about his life was told three different ways. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think there's another comparison with like all the stories about black flag and everything that happened, like the reunion shows and all that stuff. I'm sure you heard multiple versions. Um, just getting the telephone down the line from, from, from Greg. Right. Like, yeah. Well, there's also like, and there's, there's different camps. There's people that really, uh, uh, that are, that are great gang supporters. And they like, look what this guy created, which is undeniable. But they're also kind of like they they really stand for him. They're fanboys. He can do no wrong. Um, and then you have people who are like, "Fuck that guy. He ripped me off. I want to kill him." And it's like, you know, neither one of those are good stories. You have to find, yeah. you know. But you know, as I mentioned earlier, like what makes what makes a good story? Conflict. So there's yeah. a lot of conflict in the SST story and. And so that's kind of where I zeroed in, like where, where are people disagreeing with each other? You know, where, where are people at odds with each other? Where's the label at odds with different, the people that are work there and the bands, you know, like, you know, so there's plenty of, you know, plenty of crisis. Now um, I did talk to a lot of people who were there and it was, I kind of went into it hoping that it would be like, um, you know, like stone soup you know the 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 story of stone soup the little parable yeah how the guy wanders into town and um says hey i'm um you know i see you guys are getting ready for uh you know i i'm gonna plan a feast and i want to make a feast for you guys but all i have is a stone will you help me they're like well yeah i want to see how this works out <laughs> and so someone brings out a pot and someone brings water and someone brings fire and then people bring food and and sure enough, yeah, this guy did create this thing, but not without the help of a lot, a lot of people. And so I was hoping that everyone I talked to would open a door to somebody else or two or three other people. And, and that's more or less what happened is that, um, you know, I would, I would find somebody, I would ask them a question and they would say, um, yeah, I can tell you about this, but who you should really talk to is this person. And, and, and so it went that way. Um, I also like, you know, um, I read a lot of books that have come out in the last, you know, 30 years about, you know, from different people in the scene, but I spent a good chunk of the, of uh, the lockdown reading zines, um, ordering them online or reading or reading the ones online or ordering them in, in the mail and pouring over them because 
uh, even though um, Greg has gotten fairly reticent um, in it, you know, in the last 20 years or so in the eighties, like he would talk to anybody and he was right. very outspoken about what his plans for the label were when it was still a very small, small and manageable concern. And um, so, so that was good. And, um, and then, and then I had people who were really got behind the project and were supportive of what I was trying to do and who really helped me um, because there were a lot of artists like Greg didn't want any part of it. Um, Henry Rollins declined to participate and other people were not able to for legal reasons because they're suing SST and they don't want anything they say about the label like printed in a book when they're trying to, you know, when right. they're in a lawsuit, which I understood, but like, you know, at the beginning of the book, I was kind of freaky. I think at the beginning of every book, I go through a freak out period. Like what's the, what did I agree to do? And then that was when I was getting no's from these people who were like, sorry, I can't talk to you. And I realized like I was going to have to like really dig and talk to people who people hadn't talked to before, find those people and do a lot of research and read a lot of zines. And I, you know, people like Joe Carducci who worked there, um, Ray Farrell, who also worked, they really understood what I was doing and they understood that I was asking the right questions and talking to the right people. And I wasn't just trying, it wasn't a fanboy. It wasn't a hit piece that I was really interested in, you know, how this little label from Rosa beach became the sound of the underground. Right. And a lot of huge legendary bands came out of SST, you know, or filtered through and then, you know, yeah. and you get like details and interesting things like you know i i mean some of the bands that i wasn't really into but i heard them and, and knew about like you know like the minutemen were a bit i i the minutemen to me were always like a band that oh yeah their bass player is incredible <laughs> and i didn't know much like I, to be honest that's like the thing i knew about the minutemen before reading this book was yeah. oh, i've heard a couple songs and their bass player was incredible and that's just one of the things and like to know that they had this tragedy and that they had all this you know and so what i found myself doing when when i was reading the book is i was sitting um in my chair reading and then they you'd mention in the book an album and then i'd be like all right well let's put it on and listen to it while i was reading and it was a really cool experience to do that because a lot of the bands were some of them I knew like bad brains and Husker do and all that. Um, uh, it was, that, that was interesting to me, but so it was cool for like, when I got to like fire hose and all that stuff and the Minutemen, like it was, I was hearing it for the first time while I was reading it, not for the first time ever, but really hearing it. And so I highly recommend that part uh, reading it that way. Yeah. And, and I needed to do that, for example, when you're writing about the Black Flag 82 demo and how great it was. And I'm like, what? I've never heard that. So go to YouTube. And let's 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 fire it up. Yes, this is very good versions of these songs. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, the best Black Flag record that ever was. Right. And so the whole process of how that all happened and everything. And I think that Spot, he roadied for a bunch of those bands over the years, too. Right. So I have a story, I have a spot story where um, all played, when I was uh, 17 years old, all played a 21 and over show in my hometown on a school night. And um, I, and spot snuck me into the show right before all started. And uh, I just, I found, I saw him in an alley and I didn't know who he was. And uh, so reading your book, it was cool because like afterwards people, one of the, guys in my scene was like oh that was spot he's a legendary uh producer and like friend of like black flag and he's the guy that got you into that show and uh so that was kind of a neat connection i got there now yeah. so here's the thing like you're telling the story of all these bands like like there's an orbit around sst when you're talking now you're getting a little bit into sonic youth and nirvana and dinosaur jr and all this stuff that had to be daunting a little bit too right like oh absolutely 
Yeah. And, and so you're going to have an experience where you're going to have to like track down like lots of different musicians and, you know, that really uh, increases the workload, right. For a book like this and research. And I'm sure some of it you didn't even use, like, for example, like, I didn't think you wrote too much in this book about the descendants, for example. Um, but Bill Stevenson's in it a lot, you know? Um, yeah. Um, and then one of the reasons is that um, I had to make a decision early on about like, even though the descendants ended up on SST, which is a kind of a hotly contested thing. At first they were on new Alliance yeah. and they needed to mention the existence of new Alliance, of course. And like when, you know, Husker Du and descendants released early stuff on new Alliance, but I also had to make sure that, um, I had to tell the whole story of the label because I was, what I was deathly afraid of is that I would go off on all these tangents and really go into like the nitty gritty of 1979 and 80 and 81. And I'd be 500 pages into my book and it would be like 1986, you know? Um, right. I, I just couldn't do that. So there were a lot of bands that um, I've come to really love through this process that I really wish I could have talked about more, but I just didn't have the room for like St. Vitus is a great example. Uh, yeah. A band released a whole bunch of stuff. And one of the, one I didn't the, even realize they were an SST band. Yeah. One uh, of the godfathers of doom metal. I mean, just like wrote some really incredible stuff. Um, check them out. If you, uh, if you don't know them, especially if you like black Sabbath. Yeah. And and for example, that's a band I've heard a bazillion times and didn't realize they were on SSD or that they came from that scene, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that was something I learned too. <laughs> um, yeah. And and so I, I think, um, well, and it is interesting because when you, you, you look at your journey with this book is taking this insular little scene where they're, hand xeroxing flyers for shows they're playing in the park there to like are we gonna sign nirvana you know yeah. <laughs> right it's quite a it's quite a journey that th this book takes and so now that it's all said and done um because i don't want to take up too much more of your time because you've been uh with me for a while and i really appreciate it jen you're this is uh, really great stuff well, i love but, being here but like what's it like looking back at this journey with sst like this is a very unique journey that you're taking as an author with a like moment in time in history and an entire kind of musical um juggernaut in sst right like yeah, it's well, a journey i mean to be honest with you it, it's kind of messed with my head a little bit in the sense that this was a pandemic project for me yeah um, you know like i i mean i was still traveling around and going places and doing doing different things and you know i remember uh the proposal went out like the day the uh the nba the day after the nba ended their season and uh and i think that was like a moment when a lot of people were like Oh holy shit! This is this is like this is really a real, real thing. Yeah, I mean, we all knew like it was a real thing, but we didn't know how disruptive it would be. And for an entire basketball season to be just canceled was like, oh, things are about to change in a big way. And um, I was so at I'm, a book signing at Mysterious Galaxies when I found out what. When, um, yeah, yeah, Sylvia Marino Garcia. Um, and uh somebody oh, behind me in the seat was like hey they just shut down the nba season <laughs> we were like oh shit what am i should i be here or yeah i mean <laughs> i remember funny. thinking like okay now it's real i was, sitting yeah, there. I was but, doing a profile of a of a writer up in uh, monterey california for the la times and we we had known each other for a while and um so that like when the photographer was due to come and like in between the photographer coming and the interview, we heard the NBA had shut down the season. We were like, oh no, should we let the photographer in? You know, it was already that doomsday kind of mindset. 
but what I was getting back to is just that, um, you know, I I suddenly had a lot of time and nowhere to go. And I had all this time to work on this project. I could, I could write, I could research, I could interview, I could transcribe. I was just able to devote an extraordinary amount of time because, you know, I was home and it was right. home when we were like, not so much home because I, I work from home, but like, couldn't do anything else. Right. And, um, and I also had a pretty tight deadline. So I just kind of gave myself to this project in a way where, and my wife will testify to this because I would tell her everything that was going on like every day, like, oh my God, I talked to so-and-so, you know? And, um, <laughs> but like, one, it was like such a, you know, like crush of time where I like, you know, for parts of it, I wondered if I was going to make it, you know, am I going to be, can I write this book? And then I got to the point was like, yes, I can. Can I write this book on time? I don't know. And then I got to the point where it was <laughs> yeah. like, can I write this book on time and it'd be good? And I was like, I kept going through these phases where I was like, just like, just a lot of pressure, but I worked really, really hard on it because there was really not much else to do. And, and so the result was, and I talked to Dan Ozzy um, about this, who wrote Sellout, um, who had a similar experience and that he was also working on his book during the pandemic is that after it was done and we were able to take a deep breath and like, you know, watch some television, go out and, you know, do some other, come back to it, be like, holy shit, I can't believe, did I really write this whole thing? And, uh, and I'm still going through that because just this week I'm reviewing proofs for the paperback. Um, and, you know, I made uh, a bunch of changes for the paperback to, you know, correct some things, some things that were not clear, some outright mistakes on my part. And, um, but just going through everything, I'm like, wow, I really like, I haven't had the kind of focus and commitment to a single project since then. Yeah. I've worked on other things and I've like, you know, making my way, you know, as a working writer, but like, I haven't had anything that was as intense as that. And, um, and I'm starting to wonder if I ever will, you know, it's one of those things where it's like yeah. kind of light, lightning in a bottle. And, um, and then when your, your book comes out and I'm, I'm used to like music books are kind of not seen by many people in the literary landscape as real books. Um, you know, they're like, Oh, that's good. That's a nice, that's a nice job or a nice gig that you got. But like, to, would never consider reading the real project you know what i'm saying like the project the end result because it's a music book or a celebrity like it's like a celebrity biography or something like that you know like and well, I, I don't just, think i don't think of this book as a music book i think of it as a history book myself like, and I, i'm the same way but it, like you know like am i just as dismissive as like i don't know like celebrity cookbooks probably you know i mean there's you could find a category that i'm just as dismissive of and like that's fine nobody likes everything you can't not supposed to like everything that's that's fine but um at the end of the year when uh corporate rock sucks made a bunch of um best of lists for music books um that was really gratifying it made me realize like oh holy shit like people did read this book and sst matters to a lot of people and all that work was worth it yeah no that's it's really cool and then what one other thing that in in my process with philip k., doing the philip k dick research for me one thing that really changed everything and made made a, a lot of what i'm doing more possible is i took a trip to berkeley and i went to all of his childhood homes oh wow and, and i went to you know all the apartments he lived in. I w went to where the record store that he worked at was, which is a bank now, but you know, one of them is one of them's a Rasputin, but, um, and for me, one of the most important things is there, one of the things that was like fundamental for his life was that he took these $1 Thursday night writing classes from Anthony Boucher. Um, and, um, it's funny because none of the houses that Phil lived in have plaques, but Anthony Boucher's house has a plaque out front. And um, a lot of other writers came through those $1 cl 
classes. Now, a lot of the times he sent his mom or his wife with the stories because he was agoraphobic. <laughs> but um, <laughs> for me, just seeing the distance, like for so like one of the things that came up in the in the um, research was that when he moved out of the house in 1948 and moving out of the house from his mom was like this huge deal. And then I went. And saw where his apartment was and where his mom's house was and saw that it took three minutes to walk between them. <laughs> it was like putting this tangible thing on it. Do you think the fact that you lived in the area where corporate rock sucks kind of primarily takes place, the Hermosa Beach thing, do you think the tactile nature of that gave you a leg up in writing this book that, you know, being able to see those spots in your mind do you think that really was important for the book because to me that's changed everything with with phil yeah and i and i think those moments when you feel like um not to sound like pretentious but where you feel like you have some manner of authority over your subject like you're like okay like you know um you know opening up a box of research stuff and, and you already know everything you know you're like oh okay yeah i can tell this story you know um those kinds of moments are important. And with with this book, it was a little different in that um, having lived in the South Bay, I just kind of, um, again, with all the usual caveats about, uh, I would never claim the South Bay, um, you know, because I didn't grow up there. But it's just, it's different from the rest of LA. It just is. And so many, like there's a, a book about Black Flag that was written, um, by an English journalist, um, which I think is interesting because an English journalist can sometimes, you know, a journalist from another culture can sometimes see things that we don't see about our own culture. I think that's what makes, for example, Repo Man so good is that Alex Cox is English and he was a UCLA student when he was writing that and trying to understand uh, America in, in, in the era of Reagan. Um, but I also think that you miss some things. Like I think if I was to move to Manchester today and try to tell the uh, Joy Division story, I would probably get a shitload of things wrong, right? Because like I'm not from there, I don't understand the, the culture. Um, and there was a lot, a big tendency of writers from San Francisco, writers from New York, writers from England to treat Southern California as like one big beach that they're like, yeah. that, you know, Malibu, Venice, um, Hermosa Beach, Huntington Beach. There's really no difference. It's just Southern California strip malls. When, as you know, there's just enormous differences between Huntington Beach and Hermosa Beach and Venice Beach. I mean, yeah. three totally different microcosms that really don't have a lot in common at all. So um, I thought just having that knowledge, that awareness... And also just an appreciation that Hermosa was different. It was, you know, it was like a, a little seedy um, then. It was a little like, you know, had a bit of a bohemian past, you know, from the Lighthouse Cafe and the Insomnia Coffee Shop, which were, you know, places for jazz and beat poetry and things that were really important in their day. And there were yeah. remnants of that in the 70s. How could there not be? I mean, the Lighthouse is still open today. So, right. Um, and, and punk rock is so regional. Like um, one of the things, uh, a, a mutual of ours, uh, Dano Mahoney, who uh, does the Dano Says podcast, like Dano talking about Orange County hardcore is always very, very fascinating to me because Orange County has such an incredibly different hardcore scene than pretty much anywhere else. Yep. It's, it's a very unique and weird thing. Right. And so, and I was trying to explain to him one time because he was in this band 411 that toured yep. um, and a lot and dan and i go back to um like we go back from the 411 days because i tried to book them in my hometown and this whole other thing and so we've known each other a long time but i tried to explain to him one time that 411 played a show in indianapolis that had an enormous impact on our hardcore scene in indiana to him it was just another date and he said some things on stage that like really resonated with a bunch of us in the hardcore scene there. And forever 411 was tied to our scene in our head because um, 
it's a long story and I don't want to get totally into it, but basically there was some people from one band who were bullying the members of another band, kind of making fun of them. And Dano like got up on stage and just blasted the dudes who were being bullies. Right. And it, there was a huge segment of the hardcore scene in Indiana who were, were rich kids and the ones who weren't the rich kids, like, felt so much more empowered after this thing that Dano said. Yeah. And I had this hilarious conversation with him because he was like, I don't fucking remember that. Yeah. Of course you don't. You were on tour. And it was like one of a million shows. Yeah. But to us, it, it, it had this big impact. And one of the things that I think it speaks to me about this book that you just did is it, it captures this this scene and how this scene kind of like had octopus tendrils out into the rest of music. Yeah. And, and I think that's the important part of the history. So I would say that's my pitch for, that's a lot of word salad for me saying <laughs> that this is a really important book. Um, well, thank you. And I, I tend to agree in the sense that, um, you know, now we're we're kind of in our present day in music, we're moving away from an album based music industry to a song based industry. And what's interesting is that it started out as a song based industry and morphed into an album based one through, you know, the rock and rollers of the 70s. And so I think it's really interesting in that, you know, in some respects, you know, what SS is sst did was you know one of the most important independent labels of that era that championed albums of of like punk and everything that came after the independent music um and, and put it out on vinyl and created this really important uh history this musical history that would not have exist without sst um and i think it'll only become more valuable as things become more digital and more song based um, because, you know, it's, you know, who knows if, who knows what the future holds for music, but it's probably not going to be an album based industry. Well, and I, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the labels of that era, all like the could all, I mean, I'd read a discord book. I'd read a revelation yeah. records book, you know, Yep. And I'm glad that we have an SS, SST book, but, um, and I'm hoping that through that people will see that the history of these labels and, and, um, you know, whoever the lucky person that gets to write the discord book, they're lucky that Ian McKay is a history dork that has saved everything. <laughs> so, um, but, but you know what? I mean, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Like conflict is one thing. I think that's the engine of narrative is conflict. Yeah. But scene, scene politics is, I don't know if, if that rises to the level of conflict. Um, I mean, it certainly can. So yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I don't know. I'm sure like, you know, just like every. But I think conflict. the other thing, Jim, though, that drives these kinds of narratives is I think, for example, in sellout, like I'm not a Green Day fan. But reading about Green Day is interesting to me because, well, beyond the fact that I saw them in a, a warehouse with eight people and never imagined they would become the, one of the biggest bands in the world. Right. But um, having somebody explain to me why Billy Armstrong is a genius, I actually find interesting because I don't like Green Day. But explain to me why his music works for other people. I think that's interesting. Uh, another example would be like, for example, I think you did a good job of this in the book was ex like, I'm not a big Black Flag fan, but you do a great job of explaining why they're genius. Um, and, uh, you know, Bad Brains is a band that to the outside observer, you might not understand. But when you start explaining like, oh, you know, you've got these reggae breakdowns and then all the next second, it looks like you're going to have to put this guy in a straight jacket. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know singing yeah. the, the way that he does and i think telling the story of the geniuses like like when you're talking about brian baker in the studio that's fascinating to me and, I, and so i do think that with 
Discord, it might be a thing of like capturing the genius of of the bands that came out of that. I hope so. I hope so. I would. I mean, I'll be first in line to read it. Um, Yeah, I think I think it'll be a challenging book to write, though. You know. Yeah. Well, Uh, on that note, um, hey, uh, tell folk. uh, Do you have a? Are you? knee deep in a project you can tell us about or, or yeah well i've got i've got a novel coming out uh on april 11th called make it stop and it has you know some punk rock tendrils it's a, a crime novel set in los angeles you know near future los angeles and the hook for this particular book is that um if you can't it's set in a world where if you can't pay your hospital bills you don't get to leave. And so the narrator of the novel works for an underground vigilante group that breaks people out of these prison hospitals. So, um, wow. So that's, You've that's sold me already. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's kind of like a punk rock takedown of healthcare in the future. Right. So, um, you know, it was fun. I made a few, I invented a few gadgets of the future, invented a, a scary new drug. Um, stuff like that but you know people still have problems with drugs and alcohol well it's it's uh it's kind of a dickian concept the uh the being trapped in the hospital you know well uh, i thought <laughs> about that but it kind of is yeah yeah well no well it's funny because i was talking about his friend ray nelson wrote a book uh, just recently passed phil's friend and there was a part in a book that it was clearly a nod to Phil where he had a guy talking to his to uh, his door before he comes in and telling his door about his day. And then I said, well, you know, but if Phil wrote the book, he wouldn't have the money to open the door. <laughs> he would have to b- borrow a nickel from somebody to get in the front door. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I think your concept there um, is very Phil uh, in, in the sense of, uh, of how it's... Uh, studying the healthcare industry. I'm looking forward to that. That's awesome. Do you have a nonfiction book in the works or is that that the main focus right now? Yeah, well, that one's done. Um, I have a couple of other projects that- um, And the I, paperback of Corporate Rock Sucks, right? Paperback of Corporate Rock Sucks will come out in June and I'll do some more events uh, for both of those books. I have a weekly newsletter called uh, Message from the Underworld that I send out every week. It's on Substack, it's free. And so I kind of talk about what I'm working on, what I'm reading, what I'm seeing, where I'm traveling. And when there's stuff about Corporate Rock Sucks or whatever, you know, books that I share stuff there too. So um, that's a good way to keep up with stuff. And uh, and I'll probably be digging out some stuff from the archives once the paperback comes out to share some more things. Um, I've been reviewing my SST collection. Uh, I haven't done that in a little bit, so I'll probably get back to doing that. Um, just, you know, celebrating uh, the music of the label. Got it. That sounds awesome. That That's uh, really great content that you also, because I'm, I'm sure there's so many things you couldn't fit in that, <laughs> you know, you get to disseminate that. Um, Jim, this was awesome talking about your process. Um, I, I, uh, as a research nerd, I, I love it. And so one of the things with writers is that we're lucky that a, when I'm researching a writer, a lot of his papers are, are at archives and in libraries. And um, I know you're not as lucky with, <laughs> with that. You're going to have, you know, doing this like requires so much oral history. And, and I think that um, it's so good that you guys are, that you and other people that are writing these music books, People shouldn't look down on them. They should look on it. This is history. This is really important. And punk rock is becoming history. When all these albums that we loved are having 30th and 40th anniversary editions, that tells you, like, we got to sit down and get the history while we can because we're these people are going to start disappearing. Yeah, it is, it is very true. Very true. Yeah. So I applaud you uh, getting the history down and... Um, and I think it's it's a really great thing, even for a guy who wasn't a huge Black Flag fan, you know, like um, I, I I was really glad that I learned a, a lot of things about, um, you know, the history of that era and that time. And, um, you know, 
Uh, so anyways, Jim, thank you for coming. And uh, folks uh, can find Jim's work. Um, if you made it this far, um, I actually managed to forget to promote my new book, which uh, I have uh, Nightmare City that I co-wrote with Anthony Trevino came out. It's uh, also um, prime uh, sci-fi noir thing. So uh, set in uh, post cli fi Seattle um and uh so that's out there and hopefully we'll, people will find it and then um oh, we'll check it out. don't know my first nationally distributed book comes out in august jim uh the last night to kill nazis from clash books so oh you're on clash now that's awesome okay well i actually already had a book with clash one book earlier goddamn killing machines but this but this is my first one since they got the national distribution. So, oh, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it takes place in the last day of World War II, and there's a vampire. So, oh like, man, I'm I'm hooked. I, I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, for folks who love uh, Guns and Navarone, Where Eagles Dare, that kind of stuff, this is my mm -hmm. love letter to that stuff. So, um, and that comes out in August. So, uh, folks, look for that and um. Jim's books, you got uh, My Damage, um, uh, Do What You Want is the name of um, the Bad Religion. Religion book, correct? And then um, Corporate Rock Sucks. And the novel coming out is called, one more time? Make It Stop. Okay, Make It Stop. All right, so folks, get out there and get those books, and we'll talk again. Uh, Jim, uh, after I read the novel, let's talk about that one. Right on. All right. Uh, well, thanks for listening, folks.